Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Going Nuclear. I'm here with a really special guest. His name is Taylor McDonald. Uh, he is a recruiter in the nuclear energy industry. In this video, we're going to be getting an inside scoop as to how recruitment in the Canadian nuclear industry works. Right now, the, the nuclear industry is having unprecedented growth. And I know on the recruitment side, that's such an important part of facilitating that demand. And so, like, I think when it comes to recruitment, it's always kind of in the shadows, right? Like, what goes what goes on? And so, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, who are you? Who's the man behind the shadows, yeah. behind all those resumes? Tell us. All right, yeah. So, Taylor McDonald. I'm an external recruiter in the, uh, in the nuclear industry. I've been in the nuclear industry for about two years. Uh, my primary focus in, in the recruitment world is on early talent, uh, really bringing in that pipeline of talent right into the industry and the organization right from day one, and really kind of building that pipeline out from student to new graduate um, into, you know, full-time opportunities afterwards. And when it comes to recruitment, like, I think it's kind of underrated, uh, whether it be a company, like a utility, or it be a vendor, partner. You want to make sure that you're focusing your energies on that top talent, right? It wasn't until I got into the industry that I realized that recruitment, like the people that you recruit, the culture that you create in an organization um, is so important. Not only like the technical skills, right, but also behavior, right? Making sure that, you know, you're, you know, you're creating that environment with those high achievers um, and balancing things out. Like, Tell us the art of recruitment. How does that work? The art of recruitment? <laughs> uh, well, it really kind of depends on what you're recruiting for. Uh, so for me in my role, I've recruited for every, everything from one or two particular positions, um, from 100 plus positions uh, for a particular role. And you really kind of have to tap into two different sets of skills there. Um, so for that one to two position, like it really allows you to, to really wear that recruitment hat and be a recruiter. And you kind of really get to dive into the qualifications, the day-to-day -day life of the role, and really kind of find people um, that match these experiences. Uh, so something that I really like to do is just really sit down with the, the hiring manager and like really understand the role. Because uh, obviously, you know, I have a background in human resources. I'm not an engineer. Um, and I'm never going to be able to, to really bridge that gap. So that's where I got to spend a lot of time with my hiring managers to really understand what the role is on a day to day and how I can position that to my candidates to like pitch uh, the role and, and to really fill that position. Uh, so again, with those one to two position roles, what you're really doing is you're really boots on the ground a lot of the time. Yeah, you know, you're on LinkedIn a lot, kind of headhunting people. Um, you're tapping into your network. You're resharing your jobs. You're resharing uh, your positions and really just spreading the word there. But what I really think a lot of the work for recruitment kind of goes on outside of those um, actual jobs. Uh, so, you know, having a presence on LinkedIn, such as what we have here, and just being able to really position your company or your industry as like a leader in its, in its sector, I think is a really strong way to kind of have that constant recruitment presence. Um, so if you do message a candidate where you think it's a strong fit for your job, they're going to look at your LinkedIn profile. And, you know, if they scroll on my LinkedIn profile, they're going to see just like how fantastic the nuclear energy industry is in Canada and like really how much we have going on, whether it's refurbishment or small module reactors or anything of that kind of nature, um, you'll see it on our LinkedIn feeds and you'll be able to kind of see that excitement um, through our pages there. Um, oh yeah, Link LinkedIn's where it's at. Like, tell us about your inbox. Is that just blowing oh, up? God. Yeah, so this, this is something I like. I really feel bad about most of the time, to be honest with you, uh, because when I used to go to like campuses and recruitment yeah. events and things like that, like hunting like early talent engineers, I would always say like, oh, shoot me a message on LinkedIn on like Monday morning and I'll definitely get back to you. Um, but after you tell like 500 people to message you on Monday morning, like there's just, you might as well tell no people to message you on Monday morning, right? Um, so LinkedIn inboxes, it, it's a, like I can show you afterwards, but you just keep scrolling and scrolling and there's messages in there. Uh, but what I really tell people is like, just like do that double text, like double text, triple text me like just be shameless about it like keep following up like comment on our feeds because once you comment on our stuff like it's there it's public like other people are seeing it so I can't ignore you at that point right uh, but yeah no the LinkedIn inbox is uh there has to be a better way to do it because uh, right now it's just not working for for me in particular right now uh, I love this honest discussion right because I, I tell a lot of folks, like a lot of interns or a lot of a lot of people message me as well about jobs in the industry and I forget to message back as well, right? And like we're we're so busy, right? And you know, following up, that's that's the best way to go, right? Yeah, yeah, and like 100%. that's what I encourage students um, and even early career professionals is 
hey, don't just send one email. Like, you got to follow up two or three times. Yes. Like, and I double text. Like, you just got to be shameless with it, right? You just got to keep positioning yourself and keep pitching yourself and uh, really just put yourself in front of the recruiter, like, as much as possible. Uh, because really, that's just kind of like the best way to just increase your odds at getting that visibility to yourself there. 100%. 100%. And like, when it comes to LinkedIn, I want to dive dive a bit deeper into this, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, when it comes to LinkedIn or other social media platforms, um, how are candidates leveraging those platforms? Like, what do you look for in a, a in a LinkedIn profile that really you're like, whoa, this yeah. this this person is exceptional. Like, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into you know giving them the interview opportunity. Yeah, no, that's like a really great question, and it's a common question that I get when I visit campuses and, and, and different employers and events like NAYGN. Is how do I stand out? How do I leverage myself to in the market and really position myself in a way to succeed? And my response really is, and this is especially geared towards the engineers out there, because uh, again, that's my primary kind of thing that I target is the engineers, is that when I go to your LinkedIn profile, like I need to see that, that you get it. You know what I mean? Because like so many engineers, it, it's so easy to just be so focused on the engineering side of the house and just not build up that side of the, the house at all. When at the end of the day, like we're, we're a business, like we work for firms, we work for businesses. So you have to display the fact that like you, you're an engineer, but you also get that business piece. So if I go on your profile and I can see that oh this person has a robust LinkedIn profile they're engaging in the right content they get the business side of the house as well as the technical side of the house I think that just really increases your value overall so much because really you think about it you know there's so many technical based roles at, at any of the nuclear companies here in Canada but a lot of these roles are, are project based mm -hmm. and our project based roles so many of these roles are in projects right so for projects we need the engineers and we need the business people so if you're an engineer that can bring us both sides of the house like you just increase your value so much and you you leverage yourself so much. So there's so many things that like, I, I tell people to do and little qualifications that you can get. Because literally, if you go on YouTube or if you go on LinkedIn and you do like an hour and a half video, like this is fantastic things that you can do for yourself to leverage yourself and stand out. Like Power BI, for example. Like this is something that we use so much in the business world that just doesn't get touched on at all in schools or in really any other industry. So if you go on YouTube and you watch like an hour and a half long Power BI video, this is a fantastic way to stand out for yourself here. Like something so little like that can really leverage yourself and different like the different certificates that the, that LinkedIn offers like Microsoft Office Microsoft Excel different things like this like do these things like the Microsoft tickets like they take like a couple hours to do but we can see this on your profile and then it's just a plus one and it's so simple and it's free. nice what about like uh, what about nuclear knowledge uh, is that something you're generally scanning for or is it just like a bonus or good to have I'd say it's, for me, a bonus. Uh, because again, just goes back to my comment that I'm not an engineer, <laughs> right? So if I see like a can-do schematic, like I'll be able to understand it on a surface level, like okay, that's a can-do can schematic, that's great. Uh, but really when we dig into the more technical stuff and like I see these huge graphs and um, things I don't understand that I see on LinkedIn, I can say, wow, that's great, that's impressive, but I really don't know what it is at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah. So I can see you know, other people commenting saying, oh, great, this is so technically awesome, this is proficient, this is creating efficiencies. Um, I don't necessarily see that. What I will say, if I do see that in a candidate's profile, I make sure to send that to the hiring manager. So I say, hey, I might not necessarily understand this, uh, but my manager works in reactor components, and I see a post about reactor components, I'm sending that to the hiring manager and say, I can't make any sense of this, but I know you can. I think it all goes back to building your resume. That's probably one of the best documents yeah. you can revision over time. Yeah. I know I've revised my resume over a hundred hundreds of times. Yeah. As you should. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, as you should. And and so I've learned I've actually learned this the hard way. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> that for sure. actually the the resume is not necessarily a list of all the technical uh, details uh, it will have it should have technical details yeah, from sure. my perspective but um, t but uh, but rather like what is the outcome yeah, right that's that's exactly right yeah you're, you're hitting the exact thing so like I can dive into this so heavy but I mean like when you're talking about resumes I think the main thing is like just take the time to custom tailor your resume to the particular job posting you're looking at like so many times I'm looking at a resume and it's you know I'm applying for this position of and it's not in my company and it's not what I'm recruiting for I'm like okay this is a blanket resume that you've probably applied to 50 jobs for like I can tell like immediately all right so and it takes like five minutes because you can build up like a strong structure you can build up a strong shell and then like adjust it as you're going and then be able to like really leverage yourself like that. Um, so what I always tell people for resume development is there's kind of 
th there's a reference document that you can use to develop your resume. Um, that's the job description. So what I tell people is on the job description, any job description you ever see, you'll have bullet points on it. And what I tell people is to frame these bullet points as if they are questions. Uh, so the question is going to be on the job description, and then the answer will be on your resume. So tell me about a time where you've worked efficiently with a team. You know, frame that as a question, the answer will be on your resume. So I can say, okay, this person actually did the studying for this position and we're able to align their resume with the actual job description. Wow. And within the points themselves and the actual bullet points in your resume, don't be afraid of detail. Um, so in your bullet points, like so many times there's like five word bullet points, especially from the students. And I'm like, oh, I really need more detail than that. What each bullet point on your resume should say is what you did, why it mattered, and how you created efficiencies. So. Um, I can't think of an example off the top of my head right away, uh, but you know, built out Excel, Excel spreadsheets. Um, this saved our leaders time so they don't have to search for information, uh, which created efficiencies for our company. So refocus the leaders time on other things. Super rudimentary examples, but like give that to me in a bullet point. You know, two, three sentences long, that's not a bad thing. Like don't be afraid of length in your bullet points there. Incredible tips. I, I wish um, I can go back in the past and just rewatch this. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Like I just, you saw me, I just like launched right into this speech there. I mean, this is something that I just talk to people about all the time, like on a weekly basis, even with the people that I touch base with and, and um, the students that I see. Like uh, on Friday, I'm meeting with a student and um, I might as well just send them a link to this because I'm just going to tell them the exact same things as, as really I'm saying here. Okay, uh, cool. So this is just great advice across the board. Nice. Let's, let's dive a bit deeper. So one page versus two page. What do you think? Um, two pages is fine. I think people get too hung up on the one pager. Like, don't delete good things just because t you want to make it one page. Like, two pages is fine. All right, flashy versus not flashy. Like, do you want a simple PDF or a Word doc that just has text, or do you want some logos or a little bit of oomph to it? Yeah. So for me, I'm like a very basic text person. Like, I just want to see the text. Uh, but again, like, I'm recruiting a lot for engineers. Um, and that's not to get confused with the portfolio. If you have an engineer portfolio you want to share, definitely include that in. Include your schematics, designs, all that stuff. Uh, but in terms of your actual resume, I just want to see the text. Um, now I have colleagues that recruit for graphic design roles, communication roles, um, e-learning development roles. Maybe you want to be a bit more creative with those resumes. Um, but for me, recruiting engineers, I really just want to see the text, no problem. Algorithms, let's talk a little bit about that. Like. The first thing that I hear when it comes to job portals and submitting resumes is like, hey, do you have the right key terms or do you have the right, um, and this is before chat GPT, by the way. Yeah. And so for me, very confused when I heard of these key terms or how, how resumes are processed in the back end. Right. What, what does the system look like? This is really difficult to comment on because it's going to vary company to company, yeah. even position to position. I didn't really touch on it earlier, but you know, when I was talking earlier about you know the strategy about hiring 100 people versus one people, uh, one person would be very different. So when you're hiring 100 people, you're definitely more likely to, to leverage the applicant tracking system and, and its algorithmic features uh, to kind of identify strong candidates for you. Uh, but if you're recruiting, you know, just for a couple different positions and hard to fill roles, think cloud security, things like this. Um, you can just go resumes one by one. Uh, but in terms of what an actual ATS would look for, it would really be identified by, by the recruitment team itself. Sorry, what's an ATS? Um, ATS is an applicant tracking system. Uh, so this is, this is a, another great reason to, to have a recruiter on this. Uh, so ATS is just an HR term um, just for an applicant tracking system. It's just, you know, when you apply to a job, your resume goes into an applicant tracking system. And it's just kind of a one-stop shop for recruiters and managers to manage resumes and jobs and positions and, and the whole nine like that. Yeah, every company will have one of those. Really up to the discretion of the hiring team and what um, they want to search for. Uh, for instance, something that I've done in the past with particular positions is like Power BI. Like something as simple as that, going back to Power BI, watch an hour and a half YouTube video on it. You'll leverage yourself immensely. Uh, but again, like we have a really hard time finding that early talent that has experience with the Power BI, because like when I talk to universities or when I talk to, you know, early talent um, employer hubs, they're like, "What's Power BI?" And that just makes me say like, "Oh no, like we are missing the boat here so hard." Um, so again, like we've had search queries just searching for Power BI of like thousands of resumes. Just give me the ones that say Power BI somewhere in the resume. Um, so that's an example, uh, but it really will vary kind of position by position and job to job. Um, but again, that's just kind of one example. Of, of what that could another aspect that I want to touch on is your background yeah. right so a lot of folks that watch my my videos they hear about you know backgrounds in nuclear engineering yeah. what do you try to look for when it comes to 
you know, mechanical engineers or software engineers or biomedical engineers, are they excluded or um, is there a preference there or do you try to diversify the backgrounds? Yeah. Well, well, you tell me, how many nuclear engineering programs are there in Canada? There's one. <laughs> how many in the United States? I don't know, like four or five maybe? Four or five. We got Purdue, we got MIT. There's probably some out west that I don't know about. Uh, so yeah, no, we need mechanical engineers, we need electrical, chemical, uh, software, everything, everything in between. Um, what I would tell the, the engineers out there, um, if you're presented an opportunity and you're a chemical engineer and you know the role might not necessarily be chemical engineering related, um, try not to get turned off by that too much. I think this is maybe something that you can speak to a little bit more, um, but a lot of the early talent engineers, they say like, wow, I did chemical engineering, like I want to be a chemical process engineer so bad, but they're presented with an opportunity, um, maybe not necessarily related to chemical engineering, uh, it's in the realm of nuclear engineering. Um, again, maybe not ideal for, for, for these people, but I think like, you know, that just speaks to the nature of just nuclear engineering as a whole in the sense that like if you're identified as a strong engineer, like strong early talent engineer, and you have an interest in the nuclear sector, like I think you really just have to kind of jump at it there. And then beyond that, you know, mechanical, electrical, mechatronic, these are kind of the top three that we hire for outside of the demand of nuclear engineering. And we can never meet the demand of nuclear engineering across the board, uh, just because, you know, we rifled off Ontario Tech University is probably maybe the only university in Canada that can offer that actual degree there. Uh, so, you know, we do look for other degrees like the mechanical, mechatronic, electrical would be the most in high demand. And our, the managers in the industry know this. Um, so they know, they know uh, to say, hey, uh, we're probably going to have to settle for a mechanical engineer for this role, and that's okay. And that's when I really rely on my managers to kind of tell me exactly what they need. Because uh, I'll say it once, say it a hundred times, I'm not an engineer. I just try to understand these concepts the best I can. Uh, so that's when I really lean on my managers to just provide me as much detail as they possibly can regarding the role. And what I really do is I just kind of play matchmaker beyond that, right? Um, so I go to my manager and they say, hey, uh, I'm in mechanical components. I really need someone with experience in mechanical components. They give me a bunch more detail. And then I kind of, you know, hit the resumes and look for someone that matches that and in terms of projects, design, anything that they have in their background that relates to that. Um, so yeah, no, we do look for um, engineers outside of those nuclear engineers industry-wide and um, we wouldn't be able to fill any positions in the industry if we didn't hire engineers outside of the nuclear realm. My friends that were mechanical and electrical engineers, yeah. uh, when I was an undergrad, uh, they, they would have more, like a lot of interview opportunities yeah. as compared to folks and even my program with the background in nuclear engineering mm -hmm. and so um you, you know folk, people that think that uh, there's a lot of folks that think that you have to have a background in nuclear engineering to work in the nuclear industry mm -hmm. no not at all like there's electrical systems there's chemical there's yeah. there's a lot of mechanical components 100%. yeah so it's, it's so diverse yeah that's I mean, not even touching on the software piece and the computer science side of the piece. I mean, that's a huge side of what we, of what we do in the nuclear industry. Um, you know, you would understand the side of the house better being and in, in, in the engineers within the, the industry here. Uh, but the role of software and kind of automation and how it plays in, in the reactors and, and how they run. It. Tell us a little bit about that, right? Like a lot of, a lot of the young people, they're going more toward um, careers in computer science and software engineering, AI, yeah. machine learning. Tell us, like, how how is the the recruitment area changing in that? Yeah, I mean, can I get a civil engineer somewhere? Like, that's really what I'm looking for, right? Like, there's just no civil engineers out there anymore. Like, this is just something that I've noticed overall. Like, everybody just wants to code and, and, and do the software engineering piece. Um, let's say I get 10 engineering resumes, I mean, seven of them are gonna be software engineers or, or, com or computer engineers. It's just such a saturated market in all reality. And uh, it's just hyper competitive, um, if, especially that software engineering piece. Um, so, you know, I think it's great that a lot of people wanna do this, but I think maybe being able to diversify yourself in your engineering experience is great. Um, and that's why I kind of led with like the civil engineering there and the answer is joking around there saying like, nobody wants to be a civil engineering an anymore. I don't know why, but, um, like the applicant pool for the civil engineers is so poor. But yeah, even just going back to the software, I mean, things like the mechatronic engineering piece, like this is something that, you know, when I go to OTU, I really praise their staff about. It's just the ability to take, you know, the electronic piece, the mechanical piece, and a bit of that software piece, and just putting it all in a blender and just being able to be a versatile engineer, I think is just so important for us in our industry. Again, going back to the piece that there's not enough nuclear engineers to staff these jobs. So if you're, you know, something like a mechatronic engineer, where you are versatile in your experience and what you're able to do, like this is hugely valuable. 
Um, I don't want to turn off anybody from being a software engineer. It's just, you know, from what I see in my perspective, they're, it's it's a lot. <laughs> like literally seventy percent of all of all engineers, I feel like right now. Yeah. Let's d dive into that a bit deeper. Like, yeah. say you're a software engineer, right? Yeah. And I agree, it's a hyper competitive environment. Yeah. Software is a cool thing to do, right? One hundred percent. Yeah. Nobody wants. Everyone wants to code, right? Everyone wants to code. Everyone wants to code. Yeah. No one cares about concrete, right? Yeah. No. No. It's, yeah. It's not sexy, right? <laughs> not yeah, yeah. Yeah. Designing buildings is not as fun as you know. Tell us a little about about if you're a software engineer, how or a computer scientist, how do you um, how do you shine? Like, what, what would you look, is it the extracurriculars? Yeah. What role do extracurriculars even play yeah. in this whole yeah. area? Yeah. I think the discussion on this side of the house for a long time was, you know, build up your personal project portfolio, you know, have things going on, uh, build up your own little databases, build up your own little um, algorithms and things that you use in your personal life and your personal time and, and whatever you do. And um, I think this is great and it's a great foothold to get going. Um, but the reality is, is every single person now has these personal project portfolios. And I, it's really hard on my end to kind of differentiate where this stands out. I mean, something huge that I see in all the software engineers is, is the GitHub. Um, again, really just building out a strong GitHub because, you know, I, I, I jump on that. And again, not an engineer, but I can tell, you know, the GitHubs that are good from the not so great ones immediately, like within five, 10 seconds. Uh, so just the quality there. Uh, but I think like the main thing here just kind of calls back to the point that we were making earlier and just being able to show people that you kind of get it because software engineers like again they just want to code like they just want to code at the end of the day um, but you again work for a business you work for a firm you work for a company uh, so I think just being really able to diversify yeah I can code I'm a strong coder um, but I also kind of get the business side of the house and I get where the bottom line is and I get the kind of strategic direction of the organization um, that I'm applying for that I'm working for and really where we're going there. Um, outside of that and the personal projects, I think like actual like work experience is really key. And this is actually something I see in like the software engineers that, that I think I see that lacks compared to like electrical and mechanical engineers, where just like that internship and co-op experience, there, there just isn't as much from those software engineering students especially. Um, so when I send, you know, 10 resumes to a hiring manager of software engineers, um, eight of them will have an emphasis on personal projects and, and their own things. Um, and two of them will actually have you know, co-op experience, whether it just be, you know, working at like the city of Skugog for the summertime, uh, the hiring managers will value that four months of the city of Skugog more than this crazy database that you've developed in your own time kind of thing. Um, so again, just like that actual work experience, like cannot be understated um, across the board there. Again, your personal projects are great, your GitHub's great, uh, but that actual work experience in a work environment, a traditional work environment uh, is just so valuable. Well, well said, well said, like I, I share with students all the time, the first internship's the most difficult, yeah. right? And then from there, from then on, it's just kind of like boom, 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 from my experience, right? Uh, like for, for those that are looking for that first internship or that first yeah. job and they have no experience, um, how would you, what would you recommend to them? Like what, what can they do to make themselves stand out? Um, so in terms of like securing that first internship there? Yeah, so I mean, that's obviously the most difficult step there is securing that first foothold in. Um, so I think just like really being able to just incorporate some of the things that I've been even talking about so far today, you know, building up that resume, like whatever you've done, like you can make it make sense. Like for instance, for me, you know, before I started working in a professional world, like as a recruiter, I sold TVs at a Best Buy. You know what I mean? And when during my interview as a recruiter, um, I was able to kind of leverage and frame my Best Buy experience in a way that would be applicable to my recruiting experience. Mm -hmm. So for those students that are seeking co-ops, you know, you might not sell TVs at Best Buy, but you might be, you know, you might have um, a project that you worked on at school in a team and you ran into some problems there. You know, there's always things that you've done, whether it be in your education or experience that you can apply in your resume and in interviews where it makes it seem like it's, you know, very applicable and relevant experience. It's just like how about you frame yourself and how you position yourself. Um, because again, like any experience like can be relevant experience. Because I mean, like I'm pretty sure in, in Ontario, you still need to vol get volunteer hours to graduate high school, right? You have 40 hours of work experience there. Like, how are you going to position that in your resume, right? So just little things like that is is really just like how you frame yourself and how you position yourself and how you position what experience you do have to make it seem like it's it's really spot on and relevant. That absolutely, that's so key. That's so key, right? Like leveraging that experience. Like you know, just just as an example, like for me when I was trying to get my first internship, I just remember just just 
bulk applying just like yeah. crazy yeah. and i had an interview with a company that sold valves yeah. right not like your mom and pops valves right yeah. in in your basement but serious manufacturer serious manufacturer for the yeah. nuclear industry yeah. and so i sat there not knowing anything about valves but in my interview i talked about how my experience as a nuclear engineer was relevant to where those valves were being used. Exactly. You know, I started talking about the primary heat transport yeah. system. And so my hiring manager, I made that connection. And like, he was so impressed. Yeah. He was like, He's like oh, no, that does make sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And so I remember being the first nuclear engineer to get hired at a company that traditionally hires chemical engineers. That's right. And um, so, yeah, it just brings me back to your point. Like, you know, just leverage those experiences yeah. and try to connect those dots, yeah, right? Exactly like how are you framing yourself and the experience that you do have um, to best align with the job that you're applying for um, because like there are things that you've done that make sense like again I sold TVs at a Best Buy and I ended up recruiting at a startup firm and um, that might not make sense right away but you know the, in my interview I made sure it made sense to the managers right um, and I got the job so I, I think there's you know definitely connections that can be made for anything that you let's let's the dive into step two of recruitment, right? Yes. Interviews, yeah, right? Yeah. Those are pretty challenging. Mm -hmm. They take a lot of practice. Yeah. Don't don't just freestyle it. Don't freestyle okay. It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about um, you know you you focus on that behavioral aspect, right? Like that business acumen. Sure. What are you looking for in, in in these interviews? Yeah. Sure. And I mean, that would really depend on the type of interview that is being conducted there. And I would say, you know, no matter what company or industry that you're interviewing for, having those conversations with the recruiter or the hiring manager ahead of time is always appropriate. Just to say like, hey, what kind of style of interview is this? Are we doing a behavioral based interview with some technical questions in it? Or are we just going to do like a technical question interview? Is there going to be a testing component? You know, asking about the structure of the recruitment process once you've been selected for an interview is totally appropriate because like the company and the recruiters already shown interest in you so i think asking questions about in that kind of nature is totally appropriate and is definitely welcomed at that point point. and then that gets into behavioral based interviewing itself uh, so behavioral based interviewing is something that's kind of taken i guess the entire industry not only nuclear just business world by storm and you know past decade or two and really the idea of behavioral based interviews is that you're predicting future behavior based on past behaviors and it's really just as simple as that. Uh, so I think this is a great question to ask after I talked about costs, uh, Best Buy, selling TVs at a Best Buy there. Uh, because again, it's, it's how you frame and how you've behaved in your past employers. Um, you're able to kind of project how you will um, act. Because again, the best way to predict future behavior is just to look at past behavior, right? Um, so again, if I'm talking about how I used to sell TVs at Best Buy and deliver great client experience, um, I can make connections to that, to the questions that are being asked. Um, and then in terms of how these questions are actually scored, um, behavioral based interview questions, um, you know, they're usually scored on a scale of like one to five or one to 10, depending on the company. Um, and then those behavioral based questions, they'll all be weighted the same, generally speaking, uh, you know, maybe six, seven questions, and then those will all be scored and weighted at the end. Um, interview scores are kind of a hot topic. You know, oh, this person scored a 48 out of 50. This person scored a 46 out of 50. These are marginally the same um, interview scores. Um, and you know, there's factors that go into an interview. Um, that may affect your ability to deliver a good interview. So if you deliver like a 46 versus a 48, like that's gonna be relatively the same for us. Um, just some general interview tips for those behavioral based interview questions. Um, ask the interview team as soon as you sit down, like how, like how many questions are we going through? Uh, because what you don't want to do is, you know, the first question, tell me a bit about yourself, and you like go on for 15 minutes, and then there's 30 minutes left in the interview to get through like seven questions. So that's not great. So you can always ask the interview team ahead of time, like, hey, are there eight questions in this interview? Like, and then you can think, okay, this interview is an hour, there's eight questions, each question should be not a math guy, however much time that is over an hour, right? So just being able to frame and budget your time correctly going into an interview. Um, always save like five, ten questions, uh, five, ten minutes for your own questions at the end. Um, I think like bringing your own questions is like a great thing. And like my hiring managers will note where it's like, oh, this person didn't bring any questions. Like it's kind of weird when they don't bring anything. Okay. I think like key questions to ask is, you know, tell me about the day to day of the job. Um, tell me about the team, um, any key projects, high level information that you can give us. Um, then like, you know, if you want to ask questions about the company itself and like kind of the key things that are going on at the company, I think that's great. 
uh, not every hiring manager is going to be able to speak on these massive projects and initiatives, um, but that'll show to the hiring team that at least like you've done some research into into things that are going on in the industry and in the company as a whole. Uh, so again, just like bringing like really strong questions on your end, I think is like a great way um, to to really deliver good results there. Now, one thing that I hear often uh, for interview tips is like, hey, learn the vision and mission statement of the company, right? And kind of like weave that in. Yeah. Are these things a bit too cliche, or do you do you think it's is best to come from more of a genuine perspective? Um, yeah, tell tell me a bit about that. Yeah, I would say like baking strategy, like mission vision statement into your answers in like a non-obvious way is obviously a good thing. Like you wouldn't want to just rehash the mission and vision statement like word for word to the hiring team. Like that's great that you've done your research, but you know, at the end of the day, like that's not going to score you points. Like literally that won't score you any points. Um, so I don't think that's like a very useful exercise. Um, we're kind of going all over the place though, but I do think that the mission and vision statement is important, but I would put that more so on the application side of the house. Um, so earlier I spoke about, you know, developing a job, um, a resume that's reflective of the job summary. Um, the mission and vision statement should be reflected in that kind of cover letter piece. Um, so your cover letter should be, you know, here's my experience, here's my education, here's my background, here's how it aligns with the business and how I'm going to help you to, you know, deliver on your strategies and your overall goals. Um, and then again, that, that resume should be reflective of the specific position, cover letter should be reflective of the overall business and organization, um, which would be inclusive of that mission and vision statement. Uh, but going back to the interviews, I, I think that mission and vision statement isn't that important for the interview process. I mean, like if you're like a master and you can kind of bake it in to your answers in a natural way, like I think that's really fantastic. Uh, but I think that would kind of be difficult to be honest. Um, you know, maybe if your company has like a huge focus on environmental, you know, um, net carbon neutral by like 20 whatever for your particular organization. Um, if you can kind of talk about how like net carbon neutral and environmental sustainability is important and key to you, I think that would be like a really good way to kind of match an answer to a mission and vision and not necessarily be so obvious about it. Um, yeah. This how is recruiting different in the nuclear industry as compared to other industries? Yeah. Uh, just regulation, right? I mean, just the, the levels of, of, of red tape, just in terms of the industry side. But then um, the nuclear industry is also a heavily, heavily unionized industry. Uh, so you have both those things that are interacting at the same time. Uh, so you have to make sure from a recruitment perspective that you're aligning with the collective agreements of that particular um, employer. And then you also have to ensure that you're meeting um, the recruitment goals of you know, the nuclear industry as a whole. Um, just like a really basic example would be dose. Like, um, hey, I need to check if you have experience in the nuclear industry, like how much dose you've taken. Because uh, if you've taken like a ton of dose, um, like that's gonna have to be a discussion with the hiring team and with my managers as to how that will be navigated and what that will look like in particular. Um, so again, I, I, I think, or like security clearance. Yeah, so security clearance is obviously a, a huge piece of the uh, the nuclear industry here, and uh, thanks for calling that out. Uh, so I mean, security clearance, of course, you know, we're working with protected materials and protected areas uh, with assets that are um, really protected in nature. I can say protected a hundred times, uh, but it really is protected information in, in all ways. Um, so again, the security clearance is a process that if you work in the industry, um, you pretty much have to go through. And, and depending on um, the nature of your role, you're going to have a different level of security clearance. Uh, me being an office worker and you not being an office worker, you being an engineer, I would say, you know, our security clearances might look a little different, just you and I. Um, so just even, you know, having a security clearance is a really big thing. Um, and it can be a considerable asset as well. Uh, I think something that often gets mentioned is like, oh, I have a security clearance at, you know, a large employer in Canada that has security clearances. And when I'll say, great, put that on your resume. Because uh, the security clearance process is, is a lengthy one. Um, that does take a long time. Uh, no matter what employer you're pursuing in the industry, it takes a long time to go through it. Um, so if you can identify that you have an active security clearance, I think that's a huge asset. Um, security clearances are good for, for five years. Uh, so if you've done once, you don't have to do it again for five years. Uh, so that's just a great asset to have. Um, you know, even if you worked as a student for only a couple months, you have that security clearance and that's just a considerable asset to have. 100%, right? The, that clearance is like, I feel like it's almost like a golden ticket, right? Yeah. Because yeah. Um, from the hiring perspective, w why would you not hire someone overnight rather than waiting three or four months 
yeah. with the risk of them not getting that job. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And you know, there there's so many people in the industry that can talk about. I have someone starting Monday. It's Friday. They're not security cleared. Like, oh my god, and they're pulling their hair out. Um, so if you have that security clearance, like that's just such a huge asset um, for yourself there. And again, there's varying levels of security clearance uh, depending on the nature of your role and what company you're with, and. Um, you know, depending on the unionized environment, it might have more asset at some companies than not. Uh, but I'd say overall having a security clearance is a huge asset, you know, especially if it's like a dire situation. I'm a company, I need somebody in the seat Monday who's security cleared. Um, that's something that does happen. Experience. Let's talk about international experience. Like the nuclear industry is growing mass scale. There's a lot of immigration to Canada. A lot of my viewership are actually from countries like India or many other countries where students are very interested in nuclear, right? So when it comes to having international experience or an undergraduate degree from uh, from a different country, how is that all evaluated? Yeah, for sure. So in terms of international experience, like definitely an asset. Um, so I'll give you an, an example. Um, so for instance, we have a lot of people that have international experience, international degrees, and they come to Canada and then they do a piece of education. And then, you know, at that point, they start applying to jobs within the nuclear industry. Um, so for instance, you know, I think it's, great when we have um, like an international person who's going through like a college program per se and then they start applying to like our internship or co-op positions. A lot of managers in the nuclear industry you know really do value that development piece for, for the students for that young talent for that early career professional but at the end of the day a lot of these managers just want kind of a body in the door and someone that can actually do this work and do this position um, right from day one there. So I think, you know, a lot of our managers will target people, um, you know, let's say you're doing like a quick project, um, project management course in Ontario. And let's say, you know, something that we get a lot is applicants from Nigeria. You know, let's say you were at, in Lagos and you worked for like a project management firm for like eight years. Like that is fantastic. Like a manager will jump at that in two seconds uh, to hire them to work for their team. And then, you know, that, that goes back to just like that pipeline that what we were talking about. You know, you get hired as, as a co-op student, you graduate and you come back to us, you have that security clearance. Um, and then you can just, you know, hit the ground running from, from there, um, from, from within the industry there. Uh, so again, I think having that international degree and in education and experience is really valuable. Uh, but I really do think a lot of the reality is, is that, you know, we really want to tie that to something um, within Canada in particular, um, whether it be work experience here or education here. Um, I think that would probably be the best way to, to do it at that point. What about um, having an undergraduate degree from a different country and then maybe a master's from a Canadian institution. How was that looked at? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I, th I think specifically what you're talking about is like an undergraduate elsewhere and then a master's degree. Yeah, um, yeah no, so absolutely that, that would be like a great career path and I think a great kind of path to kind of follow through to get into the Canadian nuclear industry. Uh, because again, then that master's experience um, I, I think will really like provide value and just really leverage you to kind of get in the door at any of these companies. Um, with the master's piece, it gets difficult. Um, again, that's when we start talking about collective agreements and labor relations and things like this. Uh, because, you know, master's students might get bundled in one union, uh, while undergraduate students might get bundled in another union. Um, so the reality is, in terms of like student internships and co-op positions, um, for master's students, there isn't a whole lot. Uh, but for those master's students, like I would really kind of start to, to really hone in on those full-time positions after graduation. Uh, but again, you know, when we're talking about the unions and the, yeah. and the nuclear industry and labor relations, um, it gets more difficult when we start talking about master's degrees. So what, what if you have an undergrad, but you have a certification like uh, uh, PMP? Uh, is that also something that is a strong candidate or like what, what, what's, what's the right ratio yeah. when it comes to international education? I, th I think, you know, this is a really case-by-case -case situation, and, and I would, I think there's um, accreditors and things like that in Ontario and in Canada that can kind of equivalent experience. Uh, let's say, you know, you have a university degree in electrical engineering from the University of Mumbai or something like this. Um, I think there's systems and avenues in Ontario or in Canada where you can kind of equivalent this and get mm -hmm. this kind of 
um, like, hey, this is a one-to-one -one degree and this is fine. And this is something I see a lot of the times in our applications. And they'll attach that document right at the bottom of the resume and say like, hey, you know, this accreditation, this degree I do have, like would be considered, you know, a University of Toronto electrical engineering degree. The same accreditation kind of level there. Um, then of course, when we get into things like PMP, um, same idea applies. Like I think PMPs, um, you know, when we get like CPAs, like these are international accreditations, right? So that's not just a Canada thing. A thing like a PMP would be recognized, I think really kind of like anywhere in the world, uh, as far as I know, uh, much like um, like a, a certified accountant would uh, be recognized internationally. I think that's really important, right? Like for those that have the international experience, like attach that to your resume, right? Get get it, uh, get those credentials uh, compared and evaluated, right? Um, because I know, I know a lot of folks come into the industry. I got a lot of messages on LinkedIn saying that, hey, listen, I'm from so and so country and I have great experience, but I'm looking to get into the Canadian nuclear industry, and so. I always encourage, and I think this is a great message for them. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and that just goes back to just like send that double text kind of thing. It's just that kind of mentality where it's just, you know, it's really difficult when you see like 20 declines, but you know, that 21st, like, you know, you scroll LinkedIn enough, you'll see these stories that people say, you know, I tried to get into XYZ employer forever and I finally got that opportunity. Uh, so just, you know, send that double text, send that double message and uh, just like be persistent. In, um, in what you're doing and, and try different things, switch it up in, in terms of getting visit visibility to hire managers and recruiters. Definitely, great, great conversation. I, I learned so much, right? Like the value of persistence, um, how to build a killer resume 101. Yeah. <laughs> The algorithm. the algorithm, what yeah. what is that algorithm in the background? Yeah. So that's, that's some key insights. Yeah. Security clearance, like so many relevant topics, uh, especially for, for, for young professionals in this day and age. What's, do you have a last message that you want to share with the audience? Uh, yeah, honestly, like, I think this is just like, well, like we're getting strapped on a rocket ship and, and we're taking off. Like that's just the reality of the nuclear industry in Canada. Uh, you know, we see things like small module reactors getting pitched throughout Europe, uh, getting pitched in the United States. Uh, you know, I think in the past few months, we've had several key visitors come to different facilities in Ontario, you know, politicians from the United States, politicians from Europe, like the world. The world is watching what we're doing here in Canada. And I think like the new technology, the power generation, the power engineering and the approach that we're taking, I think it's just really exciting. And like I, I really want people to see like this is something that we should all be a part of and that we should all be really excited about uh, because I think Canada and Ontario have positioned themselves really strongly moving forward uh, to be like a really key player on a global stage for what we're doing. And um, with that will come jobs. Um, so again, that kind of ties back to what we do and what we're doing is that you know, there's going to be more and more jobs um, coming within this industry and you know, these key projects that we're, we're working on, you know, these projects get delivered, there's going to be opportunity around the world to deliver on similar projects with similar technology. Uh, so again, we're on a rocket ship and we're, we're, headed, we're headed right on up and uh, it's a great place to be and it's a, it's a great industry to be in uh, at this time. Well, there you have it. I have some, some really inspiring message right there to end off with. Uh, Taylor McDonald, thanks a lot. Yep, thanks for your time, Osama. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.